Hello, welcome to the Stoneham Memorial Seventh Day Adventist Church on Nobility Hill, Stoneham, Massachusetts. Our congregation has been serving the greater Boston area for more than 100 years through ministry, education, and community service. You can find out more about us at our website, stonehammemorialchurch.org, or by visiting us in person at 29 Maple Street. We thank you and hope you feel God's presence as you join us for our weekly church service. Well, welcome. Happy Sabbath, church. It is wonderful to be here, and I'm so glad that we can come and praise the Lord and welcome Him into our presence in a very special way today. If you're visiting, we give you a very big and warm welcome. If you have been sick and you're coming back, a big warm welcome. Uh, we're just so happy that you're here with us. Well, if you missed last night and this morning, I'm sorry to tell you I only have bad news for you. Like this morning you missed something very special, but there is good news because now you're here and you can get a wonderful presentation, The Revelation of Whom. And uh, Pastor Lee Venden and Marjorie Venden, we're so happy to have them both with us. Uh, we're, this week we're going through The Revelation of Whom, and you are not going to want to miss out. Uh, today, after the service, we're going to have lunch, and it's going to be a lovely lunch, as our ladies always provide. But then at 2 o'clock, we have part four, already part four, of the presentations. And then every night this week, 6.30 onwards, and they're not long presentations. You'll come, you'll get your spiritual boost, and then you'll be able to get home at a good time. And if you're worried about, oh, I'm not going to be able to get there because of work, and I'm not going to be able to get anything to eat, praise the Lord, some of our lovely ladies, you'll want to come almost just for the food. Because at 5.30, there's a lovely soup and buns and some fruit. So this week, uh, we don't do it all the time, but we have these wonderful seminars. So make it a point to come along. We had a good turnout last night. And we're praying that we'll build and be all be drawn closer together with Christ. You may not be familiar with the, the song that you're going to be seeing up on the screen. So I'm going to have um, Chris play the song through once for us. Glory to his name. <clears throat> Thank you. 
congregation says, Amen. You may be seated. The writer of our offering appeal for this morning says that sometimes when I'm given a task to do, it can be hard for me to keep focused on it. When writing a book, sometimes I get what's called writer's block, when the words just don't come easily to me. And when that happens, one thing that helps me immensely is leaning on my team of family and friends. My husband is an excellent encourager, and he provides me with support and space to complete the job. And friends hold me accountable to asking how different projects are going. The same thing happens here in our church. Our church functions only because of the many people working together as a team. Whether you're Sabbath school teachers, uh, volunteers in, in various parts of the ministry, leading out at prayer meetings, it's all because we work as a team that things get done. Today's offering will go to support our local church budget. There are many ways to support your church and what it does, and giving financially is just one of them. Pray and consider how God can use you and continue to move forward in the mission of his church. Now I'm just going to give you a quick heads up about next Sabbath. Next Sabbath, our offering will be for the Arizona Conference Revival Fund. This fund supports the work of Pastor Lee Venden and Margie Venden as they minister to churches all across this country, in fact, around the world, I think. I ask you prayerfully consider how God is blessing you through their ministry and give accordingly next week. Lord Jesus, thank you for bringing us together on this Sabbath day. Thank you for the message revealed by Pastor Lee of seeing you in your book. I pray that the funds collected today will be used to bring glory and honor to your name. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
Well, at this time, we're going to have a special time of prayer. Uh, we call it the Garden of Prayer. And if you feel uh, a burden on your heart or something that you would like special prayer for, symbolically, we come forward just to say, Lord, uh, we're just stepping out. We're reaching out in faith uh, like the woman who reached out for the garments of Jesus. Just a small acknowledgement of, Lord, we need you. And so at this time, if you'd like to come forward, please come forward. Otherwise, feel free to stay where you are as we take a posture of humility before we pray. Let's kneel. Father in heaven, what a privilege it is that we can come before you, Lord, in faith. We thank you that we can come in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that when we kneel, the greatest plea to you, Lord, is what Jesus has done and what he has achieved, so we can come boldly, Lord, not because of our righteousness, but because of the achievements of your Son. We thank you that we come now in faith, trusting and believing that you are our God and that you long to have a deep and meaningful relationship with us. And Lord, I thank you that your name has been uplifted in this place, that we are encouraged, Lord, and reminded that that's the greatest desire of your heart. Lord, we just thank you that you're a forgiving God for the blood of Jesus, that you wash us clean from all sin, and that you provide a perfect righteousness that we may stand before you trusting in the goodness of God. Today, Lord, I just want to pray a special prayer for a revival in our hearts. I pray for the Holy Spirit to be poured out. I want to pray for not only our hearts but our homes. I pray for our families. I pray for our children. I pray, Lord, that in a world that is sometimes against you, we have you, Lord, and we can stand without fearing like we learned last night. And so as a church family, we come with one heart, rejoicing, Lord, and that you have come and what you have achieved, but also rejoicing that you are coming again and we have the gospel of Jesus Christ to share with our friends, family, and the world that is in so desperate need. So shut us in with you. Speak to us this hour. Bless the lips of pastor as he speaks your words. And thank you that we can draw together and bring healing to our hearts, our home, and to our world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So at this, at this time, we want to invite the children to come forward, and as they come forward, as your custom is here, they collect an offering, so be watching for grown-ups that hand you dollars as you come forward, or $100 bills, I should have said, I'm sorry, um, that will help with Christian education. Come on forward, collect the offering, kids, and then sit down here for the special feature. All right.
Thank you. Would you like to hold the basket? Okay. Thank you. Oh, I like that. And I love seeing this great group of kids. Thank you very much. Wow. Thank you for your giving, and thank you guys for being wonderful collectors of this, these dollars to help the school. And I want to tell you a little story this morning. Well, it's actually a couple of stories. How many of you like to paint? Oh, I love to paint. I really do. And um, sometimes I do watercolors, sometimes colored pencils, sometimes oil pastels, and sometimes oils. Um, I love to do it. Unfortunately, I wouldn't say I'm the greatest, but I really like to try. And what helps you get better as you do it? More and more practice, right? There's all kinds of gifts. He is very good on the organ, right? And God gives each one of us gifts. Did we do them ourselves? No. Who gives us that special gift? God does. Yes, he does. This is one of my favorite artists right here. His name is Nathan Green, and this is called The Blessed Hope. Isn't that a wonderful picture of Jesus coming a second time? Did you? I'm not surprised because it's a favorite. A lot of churches have it. It's wonderful. And here's another one of my favorite artists. His name is Greg Olson. Isn't that a great picture of Jesus laying up on a rock, looking up at the nighttime sky? I really like that. I wish, I wonder, if I were to just take my pen right here, and sign my name. Would people believe that I did this painting? What do you think? Do you believe I did it? Let me hear you. No. no. Oh, that's sad, because I want to say that I did this. But that would be a lie, wouldn't it? Yeah, I didn't. So I don't deserve to get the credit for it. But actually, Nathan Green, who did it, though he did an amazing job, who did the power really come from and the gift? God. God. Good job. And, but it's kind of sad. The world tries to kind of make us think we're the greatest. We can do this and that and the other thing and all these special things. And even though that's really good, we want to be very careful not to think, I'm the greatest, I can do everything. 
Because really, the Bible says every good and perfect gift is coming down from the Father above. Who's the Father above? God is our Father, right? And he gives us wonderful gifts. But when he gives them to us, we want to be very careful not to say, me, 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 I'm the greatest. No, it's him, him, him. He's the greatest. And he shares gifts with us. But he wants us to remember who the glory goes to, right? Okay, well, I do know the master artist, and who's that? God, and did you know he's working in all of us right now to make us all a masterpiece? Do you know what he started out with? It's in my hand right here. What's this? Yes, just dirt. Did you know that Jesus made, that God made you just from dirt? Jesus, too? Okay. <laughs> Got to touch the dirt. All right. So, just from the dirt. And then it said he blew into this creature that he made out of the dirt. And they became a living person. Who was it? Adam. Yeah. Well, do you think, I don't know, when I was young, like some of you, my brother and I liked it when it rained because it took the dirt and made it like mud. Did you ever make mud pies, mud cookies, or mud cakes? Any of you? No? Oh, right, good. I did, and it was fun. And, but you know what? We didn't make a mud person. And if we had, would it have been of a live one like us? No, but God could, couldn't he? Jesus did. Yeah, and I'm so glad, because look at all of you. You came from that. That's so wonderful. But it doesn't mean that we have the right to think we're the greatest, is it? I want to tell you a story, so I have to switch. This is my art hat, so now I have to switch my hat for the other story, okay? This is my sea captain story. There was a man, and he always wished he had been able to be a sea captain to drive the great big ships and make them go all over the place. But all he had was a little boat and a sea captain hat. He thought he was pretty cool with the sea captain hat. And he had something else. Do you know what a megaphone is? What's a megaphone? Anybody know? Do, 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 do. It takes your voice. What were you going to say? Were you going to say that? What? I can't hear you. You've seen them before? Yeah. And they take your voice as it's kind of soft. And they make it really loud. <laughs> and that's what he liked. Because he was somebody little... Well, he wasn't probably that little, but he was a man that didn't feel very big, but he wanted to be a big man and a proud man. And so do you know what he would do? Every day he'd go out on his little boat, here, there, and everywhere with it, and with his megaphone he would say, Ship ahoy, what ship is that? Well, he wasn't always watching because he wanted people to watch him. And so he got distracted, and one day he was doing his usual call. Ship ahoy, what ship is that? And he didn't realize that there was a very big ship near him, huge ship. And they answered back, this ship is the big Un of Bengal. A hundred days out, loaded with spices and bound for the Orient. What ship is that? Well, the man wasn't expecting that. And he thought, oh, I'm just a little tiny boat, and he's a great big huge ship. And finally he realized, I've been pretty proud of myself, but I don't deserve to be proud of myself. They're a big ship, and I'm just a little guy. He said, this ship is the Marianne, one day out and bound for nowhere in particular. 
Well, he kind of got humble, didn't he? He thought he was the greatest, but he wasn't, was he? There was somebody greater, just like there's somebody greater than you and I. Who is it? God is. But God isn't proud, is he? God loves us. He made all of us. And do we look exactly alike? No, and I think that's what's so cool. I look around at you, and you're all beautiful, and you're all different. And that's so neat. It's so special. God does good work. He makes masterpieces in his work, and he's creating each one of us to be just like him. No, I'll look like me, and you'll look like you, but he's making our hearts to be like his, and that is so special. I want to be a humble heart that thinks more of him than myself. How about you? In the book of Revelation, it says, trust in Jesus. It says fear, but it means give him reverence and trust. And then it says, give him all the glory. So who gets the glory? Who gets the glory? Oh, I heard you that time. Thank you. So if he, we want to give him the glory, then what are we going to do with this dirt and what we think is great about ourselves? We're going to ask him to let us throw it all down into the dirt where it became from, came from in the beginning and lift him up and let him be the one that gets the glory, not us. I like that. Do you? I want that to happen in my life. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, you deserve all the glory and honor and praise. Thanks for the gifts you give us. All these kids here and the young at heart too, we all have been given special gifts to do this thing or that thing or the other, whether they're painters or musicians or whatever they do, I pray that they'll remember to give you all the glory and honor and praise and they'll realize you're their best friend and we will continue to stay close to you so we can live with you forever. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. Amen. Okay, you can go back to your seats. Thanks for being such good listeners. You did great. I'd like to have one more prayer. Heavenly Father, we're looking in your direction again, and we're wanting our hearts to be stirred, not just our minds, but our hearts also. We'd like to know you better. We'd like to see Jesus in this book called Revelation of Jesus Christ. So we ask for the Holy Spirit to move among us, save us from distraction, rebuke Satan's power to get in the way, and thank you that we can ask for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I have a friend who attends a Seventh-day Adventist church that was built in 1879. Boston claims to have a lot of history. A church that was built in 1879 would have a lot of history. And currently that church is wanting to remodel. Now in my mind, if you have a church that's on the national what is it called, history register or something? Remodeling might not be the best idea, maybe just sort of renovating, but not remodeling. Anyway, so they have a committee, and they're trying to plan the remodel of this church built in 1879. Now, my friend who attends that church tells me that there is a stained glass window up above the podium at the front up there, 
and that that stained glass window has spoken a message to his heart year after year after year as he attends that church. Uh, he's been going to that church pretty much his entire life, and he's almost my age now. The picture in the stained glass is a picture of the rich young ruler. You remember the story about a young man who came to Jesus and said, Master, I want to follow you, and what can I do? And Jesus said, well, sell what you have, and then come and follow me, and you'll have treasure in heaven. Remember the story? And in the stained glass window is the young ruler, and he's looking like he's having a hard time making the decision because he's sort of drawn to his possessions. But Jesus, in the stained glass window picture, is reaching out to him with a look of compassion and yearning and friendliness like, you know, come on, come on, join my side, join me. Well, that's the stained glass window. But now they're renovating, and they've decided to remove that stained glass window, and they're wanting to replace it with three angels flying in the midst of heaven. And my friend is disturbed because he said, every time I look at that reaching out, yearning picture of Jesus, it reminds me that I want to live for him and not for me. And he said, I just don't think that three angels are a good substitute for one Jesus. He said, in fact, it seems to me that if you were to ask the three angels what they'd like, they always say, oh no, don't look my direction, don't worship me, don't give me any credit, I'm no account, it's all about him. He said, it seems if you could ask the three angels their preference, they'd want to leave Jesus front and center. Well, the rest of that story is yet to happen because they're still in the middle of their renovation. But I kind of appreciate my friend's concern. The Seventh-day Adventist Church for years has talked a lot about three angels and a message found in Revelation 14. It's interesting, in front of our uh, international global headquarters, we have three angels depicted um, on our church logos and on our church signs and on our ID packages, we have three angels depicted. Uh, people have talked about the three angels of Revelation 14 for, for uh, over a hundred years now. But once again, if we were to ask the three angels who they like to have front and center, I think my friend is right. They'd prefer us focusing on Jesus instead of them. So today what I want to do is I want to take a look at the three angels message, but I want to see if we can find Jesus in it instead of maybe some of the more traditional things that are often talked about with the three angels. Traditionally, um, in my subculture, the, 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 the most frequent uh, messages that we draw from the three angels are number one, a warning about a coming judgment, uh, number two, a plea to stay out of false churches, whatever that means. And number three, an indictment of something or someone that we refer to as the beast. That's sort of typically what we think of when we think of these three angels. But I said I'm motivated to look for Jesus in the three angels. Uh, most people in my denomination, if they were asked to give a summary of what the three angels' messages are, they would say, well, probably the hour of God's judgment has come. That's one that sort of comes to our mind. The hour of God's judgment has come. They even have the pathfinders memorize this verse. The hour of God's judgment has come. But is that really the message of the three angels? Let's take a look. Revelation 14, verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the, notice what it says it has? The everlasting gospel. To preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, notice every nation, every tribe, every tongue, and every people. So what was it that the angels were bringing? The uh, everlasting gospel. Now, and they're preaching it to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Would that include Muslims? Yes. Would that include Hindus? Would that include Buddhists? 
So what message do we take to the Hindus, the Buddhists, and the Muslims, and every other person? Is it watch out for judgment, stay away from false churches, and avoid the beast? Is that a message that's going to resonate with these people groups that we just mentioned? No, it says that we take to them the everlasting gospel. So what is the everlasting gospel? Well, we continue with the, with the verse. Well, verse 7, fear God and give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment has come. Now that's the thing I said most often we think of. The message is about the hour of his judgment. Keep reading. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Now the phrase, the hour of God's judgment has come, is included in that verse. And it is in that message. But I would suggest that it is not the message. It's not the message. It's a part of the message. It's a significant part, but it's only part. For starters, we already noticed it is the everlasting gospel. And according to the prophecies of Daniel, the hour of God's judgment has a beginning point. If something has a beginning point, is it everlasting? No. If it has a beginning, it's not everlasting. So... The hour of God's judgment could not be the everlasting part of the message because it has a starting point according to Daniel. So what is the everlasting part of this message? And in order to try and understand what the everlasting part of the message is, we're going to have a little exercise in diagramming sentences. Yeah, something that most of us probably didn't look forward to in English class when we were going to school. But if we're going to diagram this compound sentence found in Revelation 14, the first part is fear God. Now, the verb is fear, and the object is God. What is the subject of this compound sentence? I heard someone say it. You are the subject. In fact, in the English class they taught us, they said this is what's called, the, the, the subject is understood. It's understood to be you. So, you are the subject. Fear is the verb. And God is the object. Now, part two of this uh, compound sentence says, give glory. So now, uh, the verb would be give, Glory would be the object, but once again, who's the subject? You again. You give glory. And then it says, to him. And I think it's probably a prepositional phrase, and that's kind of how we diagram prepositional phrases. So I uh, tried to make that there on the graphic as I was building it. Then we come to the third part of this compound sentence, worship him. Okay, so once again, the verb is worship. Him is the object, and what is the subject again? You, again, are the subject, right? So, the everlasting parts of this message or this gospel, where, did the, where does judgment fit in? How does that fit into the everlasting gospel? Well, it sounds sort of like it's a prepositional phrase, the hour of God's judgment. And my father was a preacher, and he was talking about the three angels' messages once at a Seventh-day Adventist publishing house called the Pacific Press, publishing association they'd asked him to come and give them a sort of a week of spiritual emphasis devotionals every morning for a week and they had asked him if he would speak on the three angels messages because they had the three angels message logo they had the three angels logo depicted in front of the press outside and they thought it would be nice to have him focus on the three angels he wanted to point out that the angels were all about Jesus and they didn't want us to stop short and just get focused on them. And so he said, the hour of God's judgment, if you do a diagram, the hour of God's judgment, he said, was a prepositional phrase. He said it wasn't the subject, you're the subject. He said the, the, the hour of God's judgment isn't the heart of the message. It's simply an add-on. It's a prepositional phrase. Well, after he had made his point, that particular devotional thought, one of the book editors from the Pacific Press approached him. 
And they said to him afterwards, they said, Pastor Vinden, I think I get what you're trying to do with your diagramming and so on. But just, just for the record, for the future, if you use this um, illustration again, don't call it a prepositional phrase because it's not really a prepositional phrase. It is an adverbial clause, the hour of God's judgment. It's an adverbial clause. Well, my dad was happy to know how to say it correctly so that he wouldn't be embarrassed by misinformation the next time around. And it turns out he had another opportunity to talk about the three angels because he was asked to speak at Loma Linda University and to give a series of presentations about the three angels in Revelation 14 for a week there too. So he thought, well, at least I know that when we come to the part about the everlasting God, I mean, the, the hour of God's judgment has come, we know that we, we can call it by the right name. So he did the little diagram thing, and then he said, so what is the hour of God's judgment? Well, he said, it's an adverbial clause. He thought that, you know, he's in good company. Pacific Press editor had told him, adverbial clause. So that's an adverbial clause. He said, it's not the core or the heart of the message. It's an add-on. It's an adverbial clause. Well, after he had made that presentation, one of the professors in the English department approached him at Loma Linda University, and they said, I don't know where you ever got that adverbial clause notion about that. They said, I understand the point you're trying to make, but if you want to make it correctly, don't call it an adverbial clause, because the, pr the truth is, it is a conjunctive clause, a conjunctive clause. Well, my dad was greatly humiliated for having misrepresented it by calling it an adverbial clause. And so he thanked the English professor for helping him know what it really was, a conjunctive clause. And the next time, which actually was at the seminary at Andrews University, they asked him to come and present a series on the three angels there. And he thought, well, now I know, because I had the professor, the chairman of the English department, told me at Loma Linda University, this is a conjunctive clause. So he came to the point, the hour of God's judgment has come is not the heart of the message. It is an add-on. It is a conjunctive clause. So we don't want to make it the heart of the message. It's a conjunctive clause. He made the point. After he was done at the seminary, one of the theologians from the seminary approached him and they said, I get your point, but I don't know why you called it a conjunctive clause because it's actually a causal clause a causal clause so in order to get it as correct as possible right now we're going to refer to it as a causal adverbial conjunctive prepositional phrase clause all right and what's the point of my illustration the point is this the hour of God's judgment is come is just subsidiary. It's just an add-on. It's just part of the message. It is not the message. So if we make the hour of God's judgment has come to be the heart of the message of the three angels, we've missed the point. We've missed the point. The main message is you fear God you give him glory, you bring worship before him at the time of the hour of his judgment. So it's about you and him, and him in the rightful place, and you in the rightful place, especially as we come to the close of earth's history. There is a common thread that goes all the way through all three of the angels' messages, and the truth is the same common thread goes all the way through the book of Revelation, and we're looking at the book of Revelation with a very specific purpose. The title of our series of presentations here this week is the revelation of whom? With a question mark. The revelation of Jesus Christ. And we're looking for him. And there is a thread that goes through the entire book of Revelation and the three angels' messages. I'm told that the British Navy has a way of identifying the rigging, the ropes that they use in their ships and so on in the Navy. There is a scarlet thread that runs through the entire length of every rope in the British Navy or every piece of rigging. That's how they can identify it. A scarlet thread works its way through the entire rope. 
And there's sort of a scarlet thread that works its way through the book of Revelation and the three angels that helps us to identify. That thread, the common thread is a warning against self-worship or depending on ourselves and an, and an invitation to a deeper life of faith, a relationship with Jesus that's focused on the relationship rather than on our behavior, focused on the Savior rather than on our behavior, focused on Him rather than our own works, especially in the time that's approaching of judgment. Let me just summarize it one more time. The common thread in the three angels and in all the book of Revelation is a warning against self-dependence or self-worship and an invitation to a deeper experience and relationship with Jesus as we approach the time of judgment. Now at this point I'd like to read three different paragraphs that were written to my church 130 years ago by a little lady who wasn't all that far away from here when she wrote. So here they are, one at a time on the screen. The first one, there are but few, even of those who claim to believe it, that understand the third angel's message and yet this is the message for this time. So this was written 130 years ago. There are only few, just few, who get it, the three angels' message. And yet, it says, this is the message for our time. Here's the next one. Not all of our ministers, people who are proclaiming the three angels' messages, not all of our ministers who are giving the third angel's message really understand what constitutes the message. Not all of our ministers who are preaching this message are getting it. That's my paraphrase of what I just put on the screen. And here's a third one. The third angel's message must be presented as the only hope for the salvation of a perishing world. Is the hour of God's judgment the only hope for a perishing world? The third angel's message must be presented as the only hope for, the sal of, for salvation of a perishing world. The theme of greatest importance is the third angel's message, which embraces the messages of the first and the second angel. Now, let me ask you this question. Is watch out for the beast, stay away from false churches in the hour of God's judgment, the only hope for a perishing world? I think if we're honest, the answer is no. But towards the end of the 19th century... There was a group of people that got very excited about Jesus in my own denomination, my own subculture. They were so excited about Jesus, it was like more, more about Jesus. Like the song we mentioned earlier, oh, turn our eyes upon Jesus. Open my eyes, Lord, I want to see Jesus. They got more and more excited about Jesus. They said, this is what we need. We need him. We need more of him. We need to know him better and love him more. And they began to talk about Jesus and talk about Jesus and preach about Jesus and sing about Jesus and write about Jesus. And as they were doing so, in my subculture, my Seventh-day Adventist denomination, turn of the 19th century, there was another group of people that got nervous by the focus on Jesus. And if you were here for the service previous this morning, the 930 service, I shared a little story about some members of a congregation I had who got nervous when I was preaching about Jesus many years ago. I'm going to call this group of people at the turn of the 19th century who got nervous, I'm going to call them the old guard. They were the ones who felt like we need to protect you know, the, the, the historical foundations, and we, we don't want to be liberal thinkers and move away from the stuff that's most important, and they were very concerned about what they said were our doctrines. We don't want to forget our doctrines. It's all fine and good to focus on Jesus, but we have doctrines, and they're important, and we don't want to let those things go by the wayside. Well, they were very concerned, this old guard, and they started writing letters of concern, letters to the editor of what we call the Adventist Review, which was a church periodical or journal that goes to all the members of the, con of the church. <clears throat> Still is, as far as that's concerned. They wrote so many letters of concern that eventually the same person who had authored the three quotes that I put on the screen a few moments ago was compelled to answer all of the letters that were being written by the old guard who were saying 
It's dangerous to keep focusing on Jesus when we have fundamental beliefs and doctrines that we don't want to neglect. And so the author of those three comments that were on the screen moments ago was compelled to write a response. It was published in our church journal. There is the date in 1890, and this is the response. Several have written inquiring if the message of justification by faith... What's justification by faith? We're going to look at that again in just a moment. But several have been writing about the message of justification by faith, and they're saying, is that the third angel's message? People keep talking about having faith in Jesus and that that's what justifies or saves us. Is that really the third angel's message? I keep getting letters about that. People who are concerned that we're missing the point. I keep getting letters like that. So here's my answer. My answer, I have answered, it is the third angel's message. In verity. Now the word in verity. It's another way of saying, you got that right. You better believe it. You betcha. Absolutely. Yeah. So the author's saying, you want to know? You want to know what the third angel's message is really all about? It's not about the hour of God's judgment. It's about a relationship with Jesus that saves us. That's what it's about. Absolutely. That's what it's about. Well, how could we have been so far off base as to think we were more importantly focusing on doctrine and theology than on the doctor himself? How could we have gotten so far off base? Were we really off base? Well, check this out. Written uh, in the same journal, uh, there is not one in a hundred who understands for himself the Bible truth on the subject of justification by faith which is so necessary to our present and eternal welfare. Now I want you to do a little bit of simple deduction, a little bit of kind of simple math or simple deduction with me here. The previous paragraph that I had on the screen said, the three angels' messages are the message of justification by faith in Jesus. That was the three. three. Now notice here, it says, not one in a hundred understands for himself the Bible truth on the subject of justification by faith. So here's the simple deduction. If the three angels' message in verity is about justification by faith in Jesus, and if not one in a hundred understand the message of justification by faith, then not one in a hundred understand the three angels' messages. Did you follow the deduction? Did you follow the logic? Not one in a hundred. And yet we put it on our letterhead. And we put it on our logos. And we put it out in front of our churches and in front of our headquarters. These three angels. Not one in a hundred understand the message of the three angels. Could we have been missing something? And could the three angels be anxious for us to get it figured out? Well, what is, the three, what is the message of justification by faith? One more quotation on that. What is justification by faith? It is the work of God in laying the glory of man in the dust. Margie had some dirt in her hand earlier when she was talking. She said we were created, you know, originally Adam was made from the dirt. And that, you know, I remember, I don't know if any of you know who Charles Hogabrooks is. Uh, he's a singer, um, and uh, we were at a camp meeting together one time when he was singing a beautiful song, and someone came up after the service, and, and they, I was standing next to him talking to him, and someone came up to him afterwards, and they said to him, oh, and they said, Charles, that song was just wonderful. You are the best singer I have ever heard. And Charles had an answer that I was so delighted to hear. He said, you know what? Um, he said, <clears throat> the Bible tells me we were made from the dust which means that really, truth be known, we're just animated mud. So he said, how can animated mud take any credit or any glory for anything good? He said, if you like the music, give God the credit. And I thought that was a neat response that he did. A neat response. But it says here, the justification by faith is the work of God 
in laying the glory of man in the dust and then doing for man that which it is not in his power to do for himself. So here's a question. What can man do for himself towards salvation or towards overcoming sin or Satan? What can man do for himself? In John 15, verse 5, Jesus said, Apart from me, you can do how much? Nothing. So how much can man do for himself apart from Jesus? Nothing. Zero. Tried to illustrate that on the screen up there as though it was a chalkboard. Uh, y, that stands for you. Standing alone by yourself on the left side of the equation are capable of, according to this verse, producing zero. Nothing. Me by myself, nothing. Can't produce anything. But you know Philippians 4.13 is another scripture. And it says, I can do all things through who? Through Christ. Who does what? Strengthens me. So I tried to illustrate that one on the blackboard also. Why? Now you notice that's you. But this time, on the left side of the equation, you're with Jesus. So you plus Jesus equals, and that's supposed to be the infinity sign, the sideways eight. That stands for all things. So there on that equation, notice, when you're with Jesus... Everything is getting done, but you notice the previous equation said without him, nothing is getting accomplished. In fact, let's just look at him real quickly. There we have him. In one equation, all things are getting done, but you by yourself, nothing is getting done. So here's a question. If nothing gets done without Jesus, but in the top equation, everything is getting done, what's the difference between the two equations? It is the presence of Jesus, right? Now, if Jesus is the distinguishing difference between those two equations, if everything gets done when Jesus is in the picture, then who would get the credit for whatever it is that's getting done? Jesus. Not me. Jesus, right? So I would have nothing to boast about, nothing to glory about. All the glory would belong to Jesus, right? He's the one that gets all things done. Okay, so if getting the things done is God's part, what would be my part? My part would be getting with Jesus and continuing to come to and stay with Jesus on a daily basis. Not just once a week at church, not just praying for food before I eat it, but daily time with Jesus. That's my part. And as I do my part, spending time with Jesus daily for the purpose of becoming better acquainted with him, when I do my part, he does his part, which is the all things that are necessary in my life. That actually is another way of describing the message of justification by faith. Jesus doing all as I come to him in faith, relationship, spend time with him, and he takes me from there. Now let's see a little, let's, let's look a little deeper into the three parts of these three angels' messages and see if we can see any more insight based on what we've just talked about. So the first part of the compound sentence said, fear God. What does fear God mean? Obviously it does not mean to be in terror or terrified of him or afraid of him. It's not what it means. It means to hold him in reverence. It means to hold him in awe. And I would like to suggest that you never hold anybody in awe if you don't know them. Does that make any sense? If you don't know them, even if they were awesome, you wouldn't hold them in awe. Uh, I'll give you an illustration. My parents, when they first retired, they, had they retired in Arkansas, uh, not too far away from a town called Benton, Bentonville. I don't know if you've ever heard of Bentonville. Um, Bentonville is where Sam Walton grew up. Have you ever heard of Sam Walton? Sam Walton and his family have a chain of stores. Have you ever heard of the stores? Who knows what the stores are? Walmart, okay. So Bentonville, Arkansas is where Sam Walton grew up, and that's where he was living when he started the Walmart chain of stores. As we all know, Walmart has been, in terms of business, it's been a fairly uh, 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 pr successful business. So one day, Sam Walton, driving an old Chevy Beater pickup, wearing overalls and a John Deere cap, 
went to a Peterbilt semi-truck sales lot. And he got out of his beater pickup and he walked over to a semi, started kicking the tires. You ever heard about tire kicking? He's kicking the tires and looking at the semi and a salesman came out and he said, can I help you, sir? He says, well, I'd like to, I'd like to have a little more information about this truck here. And the salesman took a look at him and said, I'm sorry, sir. Uh, I don't have time for you. He said, these trucks sell for $300,000 and it's clear that this is out of your price range. Uh, uh, we're not going to waste time here today. I just encourage you to go ahead and go somewhere else. So Sam Walton got back in his pickup and he drove further down the road and he pulled over at a Kenworth Peterbilt sales lot and he bought 100 Kenworths. <laughs> And when the Peterbilt, when the owner of the Peterbilt lot heard that Sam had come first to his lot, he said to the salesperson, what were you thinking? A hundred trucks at $300,000. What were you thinking? You know what the salesman's reply was. I didn't know who it was. He was fired. Now what was the implication when he said I didn't know who it was? The implication was if I had known it was Sam Walton and that he could afford a hundred of these, I would have treated him differently. That's the implication of what he was saying. I said a few moments ago, you don't hold somebody in awe if you don't know who they are. How does that tie in to these three angels' messages? First one said, fear God. It's another way of saying, hold him in awe. And you're never going to hold God in awe if you haven't become more acquainted with Him and who He is. And so, the first angel's message has in it an invitation for us to become better acquainted with Jesus. Because if we're not better acquainted with Him, we would never understand what He means to us and to the world. Right? So instead of saying the hour of God's judgment has come, we see in the first message an invitation to fellowship with Jesus, an invitation to know him better, an invitation to become acquainted with him as your friend because you're never going to hold him in awe if you don't know him. Our daughter was going through the Salt Lake Airport one time, and as she was going through the airport, Meg Ryan was walking down the same tram. Um, what do you call them? Anyway, she's walking from one to another. My mind is losing the, the word for it. Terminal? Yeah, okay. Concourse, thank you. So Lindsay, that's our daughter. She's walking along and she's, and, and Meg Ryan. If you don't know who Meg Ryan is, uh, Meg Ryan is an actress, fairly well-known celebrity whose face at one point or time was on the cover of most magazines and was quite well-known. And at that time, that was when my daughter was walking down in the Salt Lake Airport, and there she was. And, and our daughter, Lindsay, she didn't want to be like the paparazzi and mob her and make a big deal in front of everybody. And so our daughter was trying to be cool, calm, and collected and trying not to stare and gawk at her. But she couldn't help, kind of kept... Finally, it just got overtook her. And she sat alongside of Meg and she said to her, I really enjoyed you in, and then she named a film she'd seen that Meg had been in. And Meg said to her with a smile, she said, bless you, sweetheart. And our daughter Lindsay's like, oh my, Meg Ryan said, bless me, sweetheart. Oh my, I mean, how many of my friends can say Meg Ryan said, bless you, sweetheart, to them, you know? But then Lindsay thought, I don't want to make a big deal, so she backed off and kept walking. Turns out Meg was going to the same gate that Lindsay was going to. Well, they got to the gate. Meg sat down in a chair. You know how in the airport often they'll have rows of seats that are hooked together? 
and they'll have two rows of seats hooked together that are back to back, you understand? Like if we took these pews and just turned one of them backwards to the other one. Meg sat down in one of the chairs, she put sunglasses on, pulled a collar up around her face, had a hat on, and started reading a magazine in front of her face. Lindsay read the body language and said she's trying to be under the radar. She doesn't want to be mobbed. She's trying to have a low profile, so I'm not going to make any more deal about her. So Lindsay just sat across, and, and there was a whole group of young college-age men who were seated on the row of chairs on the backside of Meg Ryan. And Lindsay didn't say a thing. And finally, they called for the first-class passengers who had first-class tickets to board, and Meg got up and went onto the plane. And after Meg was walking into the little corridor thing into the plane, Lindsay said to the college young men, did you see Meg Ryan sitting behind you? And they kind of had a conniption, like, are you kidding? Meg Ryan was sitting behind us, and we didn't even know it. This girl who's on the cover of all the magazines, we didn't even know it. Where is she now? And that's the back of her going into the plane right now. Oh my, they said. They were having a conniption because they didn't realize who it was. And they had said basically if we had known who it was, we would have been different in how we treated her. Well, Jesus is so much higher than Sam Walton and Meg Ryan. They don't even exist in the same universe in comparison in terms of value. And yet, we often don't appreciate the fact that he wants to be friends with you and with me. Why? Because we haven't taken the time necessary to become better acquainted with him, which is the only way we'll ever hold him in awe. Fear God. All right? Made the point? We're trying to make the point. The three angels' messages are really about Jesus. There's the first one. Let's go on to the second one. Give him glory. Did I miss something? Give him glory. Remember it said, you give glory to him. Now, if I have not yet discovered that I can't save myself, if I haven't yet discovered that it's going to have to be all him and none me, then who's going to get the glory or the credit if I make any progress? Have you ever heard people when you say to them, that was really cool what you did, and they say back to you, thank you, as though they were responsible for it, right? Uh, I've had people say to me after a church service, back at the door, they've said to me, that was the best sermon I ever heard. And you know what? If I said thank you, do you know what that implies? I'm taking credit for it. Now, if I prayed before I started that the Holy Spirit would use me and that God would say whatever needed to be said through me and I would be more like, you know what a ventriloquist is? A ventriloquist holds a dummy, right? And if I'd be more like the dummy and God would be the ventriloquist and he'd use me to say something for us to draw closer to Jesus around, then if I say thank you when you say good sermon, I am taking credit for being the ventriloquist. Does that make sense? If I don't realize that Jesus is all in all, then there's a very real danger that I will start taking the credit for what he's doing. You do yourself and your pastor a big favor. Don't talk to your pastor like he's really a great presenter. If you appreciate what he says, under the guidance and the whole anointing of the Holy Spirit, let him know that the Holy Spirit spoke through him today. That's a different way of saying it, you know. I made this point at a seminar not too long ago, about three seminars back, and a lady came out after the service, and she shook my hand, and she said these words to me. I thought it was pretty cool. She'd been paying attention. She said, I'm telling you what, if Jesus hadn't used you today in that sermon, it would have stunk. <laughs> Uh, it was her way of trying to make sure that he got the credit, right? He got the credit. See, it's far too easy for us to take credit. Far too easy to depend upon ourselves. 
than to depend upon him. In fact, I would suggest that probably one of the biggest challenges in the Christian life is to come to depend more and more on him and less and less on myself. It is so easy for me to slip into self-dependence. Just slip into it as easy as pie. And if I am depending on myself, I'll end up taking the credit that's not mine to take. Give him the glory. That does not, that's not something that happens when people are depending on themselves. Don't give him the glory. Michael Card, a, a, a Christian songwriter and musician. Some of you may know him. Um, a friend of mine went to a concert that he was giving near Denver, Colorado. Christian concert. And as Michael Card played, began to play the first song that night at the concert, it was a familiar song. The people who were there to hear recognized it as one of the songs that, that had become well-known as one of his songs. And they started to applaud. And Michael Card stopped the song. Right in mid-music, just stopped the mid-beat. He just stopped the song. And then he said these words. He said, I know when you applaud that in your heart of hearts, you're giving God the glory for the message that's speaking to your heart. But I just need to ask you to do me a favor. When you applaud, he said, I get confused as to who's the creator and who's the creature. And so for my sake, he said, I'd like to ask you not to applaud tonight so that I don't get confused about who gets the credit. I thought that was a really cool thing that he said. I want God to get credit. If there's good things to be gotten from tonight's concert, I want the credit to go to him, not to me. I thought that was wonderful. It's far too easy for us to take the credit to ourselves. I was a school teacher for a number of years, almost nine years I was a school teacher before I became a pastor. I taught religion classes. They called me the Bible teacher at Seventh-day Adventist high schools. And I was teaching at a high school, Seventh-day Adventist high school in Colorado. It was the winter time. And I had a van sitting in our driveway that hadn't been run for about three or four months. It wasn't the car that we drove primarily. We had another car. But during a break, I had a one-hour break between two class periods. And I needed to go to the bank to take care of a little bit of business. And so I thought, I'll just take the van because the van hasn't been driven for quite a while. It'd probably be good for it to have started and, and driven um, get the cobwebs out and get the gasoline circulating and so on. So I ran home between classes, got in the van. I should have realized when I first tried to start it that I could be in for trouble because when I went to start it, it went like this. And then it started, boom. And I thought, oh, good. I'm glad I'm driving this because it needs to have the battery charge, you know? I drive to the bank. Now, the, drive, the bank has a drive-through. It's called a drive-through window, which is sort of a strange way to put a sign out because nobody drives through the window. But, but anyway, it said, drive-through window. Can you imagine what would happen to a bank teller if you took them serious and just drove through the window, you know? Hey, what are you doing? Well, the sign said, drive-through window. No, 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 no. Well, anyway, at this particular bank, the entrance, the driveway to the drive-through window was narrow and there was grass on both sides of the concrete and there were cement curbs. So it was kind of like a little narrow curving drive that went around and kind of passed some bushes and eventually through the lawn and then on around to where the teller was. And I picked a day, particularly a time of day that many other people had decided to go to the bank that day and they were all in the drive through lane. So I'm in the drive through lane and I get cars behind me. Now I have about eight cars behind me as I'm inching my way along towards the teller. I finally get to where the teller is. She opens the little drawer that comes out, zoom, and through the microphone she says to me these words. How can I help you, sir? And as she said those words, the, the van ran out of gas. I said to her, well, I just ran out of gas. She said, you've come to the wrong window. She said, what are you going to do? You're holding up all the traffic behind you. This is a three-quarter ton Chevy van. And I was all by myself. And I thought, what am I going to do? Well, I got out of the van, put it in neutral, and I tried to push it further down the driveway to a place where there was a wider spot so I could kind of get out of the way of all the rest of the traffic. I knew I had to get back in time for my class period where I was going to be teaching. 
And I looked down the block and I could see a gas station. So I took off on a run for the gas station. This is many years ago when you could get gas for a much different price than you get today. I came running up and out of breath, I said to the attendant, can, do you have a gas can you can put a little gas in? I just need a gallon's worth of gas to get, get my van. I said, I, I'm driving a van that hasn't been run for three months, and I'm, I'm nervous about it even starting, but I need a gallon of gas. So I'm stranded back at the bank. So he pumps the gas for me, and as he hands the can to me, he says, good luck, and I say, thanks, I'm going to need it, and I turn and run back to the van. I get back to the van, I add the gallon of gas to the bank. Remember, this is a three-quarter ton van. This is a very long van with a long uh, chassis, and, and I'm thinking, this, is not, this battery doesn't have enough power to get the gas all the way to the front. You know, it's going to go dead before it gets the gas to the carburetor. Um, I get back into the driver's seat, and I think, you know, why don't I pray about this? Have you ever heard people say we tried everything, there was nothing else that worked, there's nothing left to do but pray? Ever heard people talk like that? That's kind of an odd, almost like, well, why didn't you start with prayer? Why did you wait till the end? We tried everything. You know, when you say it that way, what you're really saying is, I depended on myself for as much as I could, but it didn't work. I finally decided I better depend on Jesus. That's what it means when I say we've tried everything, there was nothing left to do but pray. So I thought, why don't I pray first? So I said a prayer. I said, Lord Jesus, um, this is not a salvation issue, and if the van doesn't start, I'm not going to leave the church or leave you or anything like that, but I'd just like to point out that the van hasn't been driven for three months, and it ran out of gas, and I have, can I mention this to you, Jesus, I have a Bible class to get back to, <laughs> and I'm just wondering if you'd make it start for me, and I said, amen, I turned the ignition key, and I'm telling you what, it started instantly. It never did any, it just went, vroom. I was so flabbergasted that, you know, I almost, my mouth almost dropped open and drool almost started to come out of my mouth. Oh, I, I put the car in drive. I whipped over to the gas station. I said, put a couple more gallons in because I don't have time to fill it right now. I'm late to a class. I'll come back and fill the tank later. So he's putting a couple more gallons in just to make sure I don't run out between there and the school. And as he comes up and takes my money, he says, I thought you said it wasn't going to start. And I said to him, well, I guess I just got lucky. And I drove away to teach Bible. Who, did, who, who just took the credit in that story? Who deserved the credit in that story? Do you see how easy it is to take the credit? And the second angel said, give him the glory. Yeah, let's look at that slide. Abraham, remember him? He was known as a man of faith, right? Abraham, he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promises of God, but he was strengthened in his what? His faith, and in his faith, who did he give the glory to? He gave God the glory. He gave God the glory. It is far too easy for us to give the glory to the wrong person. But there is no glory for the work of man in the gospel. All the glory goes to Jesus. What happens to the glory of man? Well, it goes to the dust. Remember, we saw a little quotation. It said, justification by faith is the work of God in laying the glory of man in the dust and doing for man what man is incapable of doing for himself. They didn't like Jesus because he taught that. They were all about self-recognition. They were about keeping the rules and God accepting them because they'd done such a great job. We got 100%. You have to let us in. And Jesus is there telling him, no, it's not about what you do. It's about what he does. And they didn't like that. In fact, they crucified him for pointing it out. And we're still that way in the human race. Do you know what? We make a big deal and we make movie documentaries about what we call self-made men. Self-made women. We say he started out picking cotton in the South. He went on to become a billionaire. And we tell the story of how he turned nothing into a fortune. And we make movies and people watch it and they say, that's the American dream. You can do anything and be anyone in America if you're willing to work hard. You can be a success. You can have a Fortune 500 company. You can do it. Nike says, just do it. You know? 
You can do it. Another phrase we use, I got this. You got this. We got this. That's a phrase that goes right to the heart of man depending on himself and taking the credit and the glory himself. You see? It's just woven in our fabric. And yet the, third, the second angel is saying, no, 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 no. It's about recognizing who you're dependent. Who keeps your heart beating? You got this? Yeah, right, you got this. If he didn't keep your heart beating, you wouldn't have done a thing. Who gets the glory? Not you. He does. He got this. Do you know what I think? I think one of the things that makes Satan more angry than anything else is he has to know that the whole reason he can keep doing what he does is because God hasn't taken his life yet. Must just make Satan so angry. Satan's probably the one who authored that song, I Did It My Way, you know? Me, me, me. Well, there are people who say, well, we have to have self-esteem, you know? You've got to have a little, you know, little glory. 1 Corinthians 5, 6 says, your glory is not good. Don't you know that even a little leaven leavens the whole lump? And so Paul says in Galatians 6, 14, here's what I want to glory in. He says, God forbid that I should glory except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. If I'm going to boast about something, he says, I'm going to boast about who my friend is, Jesus. If I'm going to boast or brag, I'm going to brag about what he did for the human race. He's who I'll boast about. He's who I will glory in. And the third part of our compound sentence was worship him. Worship him, and if God is not the one who's re worship, being worshipped, then man is the only other person who's left. And that's why we have celebrities. That's why we have celebrities. Whether they're sports celebrities or theater celebrities, the reason that we have celebrities is because the human race wants to glorify man. It wants to glorify self. And so we make a big deal and we get autographs and we get our selfies with them and we buy t-shirts with their pictures and we spend lots of money to go to their concerts and we scream and yell and act like complete idiots because they're here. Who are they? They're just a human who goes to the bathroom just like you do and eats just like you do and sleeps on a bed just like you do. They're just another human but somehow we have turned them into idols. And they have shoes, and we want shoes like their shoes. And they wear a dress, and we want a dress like their dress. And they have a shirt, we want a shirt like their shirt. Why? Because it's in our genes and chromosomes to worship self. And that's why the third angel says, worship him. Him. Not self. And so the three angels are just over and over saying to the human race, He's your friend. He deserves the credit. Depend on him. He's there for you. You can trust him. You can come to know him. It's all about him. It's not about his judgment is come. It's about he wants to be your friend. Isn't that wonderful news? That's the message of the three angels. That's the message of the three angels. And so Jeremiah 9, verse 23 to 24 says, this is what the Lord says. Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Nor let the rich man glory in his riches. But if you want to glory in something, it continues. If you want to glory in something, let him who glories glory in this, that he's my friend, that he knows me, that he understands me. What's he saying here in Jeremiah? He's saying, you want to have something to boast about? Jesus is your friend. That's worth boasting about. Listen to Buddy Hotelling sing our closing song. I've spent time among the wise But I've tried looking through their eyes They know wisdom's not the it's understanding you And I've spent time among the strong Figured out that I was wrong What helps them to carry on Comes from knowing you 
knowing you I love with joy and peace without you love will always cease you're the only place they have to go wisdom faith and strength can reign wealth can flee but you remain your conscious grace the resting place I spend time I've heard it time and time again The greatest riches find them when They're understanding you And may I learn from all this time That if I'm ever meant to shine That my prayer should be that I'm Understanding you Knowing you I love and joy Without your God, it's all would cease. You're the only place I have to go. Wisdom fades and strength can wane. Wealth can flee, but you remain. Your precious grace, my resting place. May I learn from all this time. That if I'm ever meant to shine, that my prayer should be that I understand. Lord Jesus, thanks for the good news that you're our friend. Thank you for the revelation of Jesus Christ. Save us from failing to appreciate what a friend we do have in you. And um, draw us into an ever closer walk with you. For Jesus' sake, amen. Don't forget there's a lunch today and then a 2 o'clock meeting and then the re Sunday through Friday evening meeting, 5.30 food, 6.30 meeting. God bless you. Thank you for watching our program today. If you would like to get in contact with us, please visit our website at stonehammemorialchurch.org or call us at 781-438-2977. We hope to see you soon in person at our church on Saturdays for our 1055 a.m. worship service or for Monday night prayer and fellowship at 630 p.m. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you peace.